वेलकम टू मेरलू ऑर्गेनिक ऑर्चर्ड वी आर ऑर्गेनिक मल्टी फ्रूट ऑर्चर्ड सिचुएटेड इन दातुनी विलेज जस्ट ऑफ कनकपुरा रोड बेली फाइव किलोमीटर फ्रॉम द लाइस ऑर्चर्ड वी हैव अ वैरायटी ऑफ फ्रूटिंग ट्रीज मैंगो एंड कोकोनट बीन द मोस्ट डोमिनेंट वन एंड इट्स ऑल इंटरस्पर्स्ड इट्स ऑल मिक्स्ड अप आई शो यू नाउ कम ऑन main team ranga and anandama they have been here for about 15 years with us and the place basically runs only because of them this is our cow shed we have our store rooms behind um and everything up from here is our organic is our mango orchard uh there's two main aspects to farming at merlu water conservation and soil conservation Water conservation is basically what we try to do is ensure that every single drop of water that lands on the farm stays on the farm. Uh, this this ensures that our water table is topped up, so to speak, and ensures that we don't have too much soil erosion. You'll see as we go up the mango orchard how the farm is broken into steps, and now we have multiple catchment areas everywhere, including a stream that flows through the farm that we try to make the most of. The second thing is soil conservation, and it's not just the uh, preserving the soil that we have but also enhancing it we try to do as much as we can with our compost and mulch to try to bring as much biodiversity into the life in the soil mixture so let me just show you what our compost heap looks like and then we can move on to the mango orchard this is our compost heap as i said earlier labor is a problem in farming generally so we try to keep things as simple and efficient as possible so that we can get the work done with as few people as possible so unlike most places that build a little bed to have to mix that compost and layer it and stuff we as i said keep it as straightforward as we can this is basically a mixture of cow dung from the cow shed that's removed say every alternate day a mixture and our soil and a whole load of just leaf dry leaf wet leaf all sorts of greens that we can find and put into it um we don't get into adding different kinds of soil or ash or any of these other additives again because we're trying to do natural farming and we want it to mimic what would be found in say a forest environment um there are over a thousand varieties of mango just in this country we of course can't do justice to that we have over nine varieties over here but it gives you an idea of just the kind of variety that you find just in the subcontinent of this country itself mangoes originally uh, were found or originated in the northern and western parts of the country near what is today west bengal parts of bangladesh um and has moved to different parts of the country a uh, different parts of the world actually uh and now you find varieties that are native to places like the united states of america mexico and you'll find that mangoes are grown everywhere in the warmest part of the country so around the equatorial belt up to maybe the tropics um i will just walk through the farm and i'll show you some of the varieties that we have um and we'll see if we can pluck some and get a few examples to show you the benefits to growing trees in an orchard system is that it does not require as much day to day work in the sense of uh taking care of the plant itself if you're trying to grow lots of vegetables if you're trying to grow paddy ragi corn any of these things i mentioned previously there is a lot of work that goes into maintaining the crop itself it's a very extensive process requiring a lot of say weeding in a lot of cases spraying of the plants and vegetables and having to keep rotating the crop to ensure the health of the soil with a multi orchard system a lot of those 
elements are removed from the equation because you're caring for a tree uh, and you have the opportunity to grow things around it. We have chosen to not do that too extensively, again for the labor situation. But the idea is that, again, you're kind of trying to recreate a forest environment. Um, the benefits of the, I mean, of course, the uh, drawbacks of having a system like this is that you're not going to have a lot of fruiting for the first five, six, maybe even eight years, depending on what you're growing, what variety you're growing, so on and so forth. But once the fruit does start to fruit, or once a tree, sorry, does start to fruit, you will have year on year yield and based on how you care for the plant, it's going to increase or decrease and it's just about that. Pruning is a big part of it, but that's all at the beginning stages and then mostly just for maintenance purposes. For those of you looking to grow new mango plant into a tree, there are, I would say, a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, from our experience, trying to do it from a seed can be a little tricky because the plant requires a lot of care for the first two, two and a half years to get it to grow to, into a healthy sapling even. Uh, we recommend go to trusted nurseries. Um, Leave it to a nursery to do all of the hard work for the first couple of years. Most nurseries have their own uh, mango saplings that they've curated for years and years and they know how to take care of the plant initially and even once you buy it from them and try to plant it yourself. Um, the way we go about it is we dig a two foot by two foot by two foot pit um, and we leave about half a foot of mud right at the bottom. Uh, we set the sapling in about one and a half feet into the ground because of course we want the tree to have a strong root system and a good uh, footing in the ground so that it isn't susceptible to strong winds, rains, etc. etc. Um, the rest of, I mean, w once the sapling is set in one and a half feet, we cover the rest of it with a mixture of our soil, our compost in a one is to one ratio. And then we layer that with a whole load of mulch that is constantly replaced and replenished every couple of months. Um, whenever there are, whenever we do any of the weed whacking around the farm, all of that, uh, all of the leaves that are cut are left in the soil to kind of go back in the soil, break down, and again, as I said, improve the bio life in the soil. But for the individual pits, we collect leaves from other mango trees. It's a mixture of both dried and wet leaves. And this ensures that, A, when we are watering, um, we lose a lot less water to evaporation because there's a covering of leaves that prevents that from happening. And secondly, this, this layer of leaves on top ensures that the soil at the bottom remains cool and moist for longer periods of time, which is exactly what a young sapling needs to be able to push its roots through soil to get a better uh, footing in the ground. And for those of you who have young, young trees, old saplings, however you want to call it, um, there's a little bit of maintenance that goes into ensuring that the tree grows well and you can, keep, you can grow it in a healthy manner. Basically, of course, you're trying to grow it organically without using a lot of pests, without using any chemicals to ensure that you don't have pests. And the way the tree grows can be key to ensuring that there are less chances of, say, pests grow, I mean, pests coming to the plant or sort of fungus and fungal infections because of, say, moisture that is in the tree. Um, pruning is a key part of doing this and basic, straightforward pruning principles apply to mango trees as they do for most other plants. Um, you want to ensure that the branches and are cut off in a way that opens up the inside of the plant, uh, of the tree, to ensure that there is a little bit of ventilation and it ensures that there isn't a lot of dampness and moisture in the center of the tree, uh, allowing for not just the, the tree itself to grow better because it has more space on the inside, but also for fruit to grow more healthily because they do have more exposure to uh, sunlight, they do have a little bit more, as I said, ventilation moving through the plant. That tree is actually a prime example of how you want to go about pruning a tree to get that movement of air inside of it. Um, as you can see, we've pruned it uh, initially very low and in the center of the tree, yes, there are branches growing, but there is a lot of space within. You can look, you can see through the tree onto the other side. Um, and of course, we'll get closer and you can see how there is a good spread of 
fruit even on the inside as well as on the outside. This is one of our mallika trees and uh, you can see that right at the bottom split into two, split into two, split into two basic pruning principle which allows for an opening on the inside. This has an added advantage of making it easier for us to get into the get to the center of the tree and do more efficient plucking. This means we don't have to leave branch, uh, fruit that are on high branches that we can't reach otherwise. It means we can get to the center of the tree, climb the branches and all of that. Uh, pruning also, if done regularly, helps us keep this the size of the tree relatively manageable from a standpoint of being able to make the most of the yield that you get and being able to pluck all of the tree. If the tree is too tall, that becomes too difficult. So the life cycle of a mango fruit begins all the way in January. We usually start seeing the first flowers come out in the end of Feb, uh, end of Jan, sorry, first week of February. And um, they stay on the tree for about 45 to 50 days. Now, the, the flowers that show up at the end of Jan, beginning of Feb, are usually the varieties that, are, that ripen at the beginning of the season. In our farm, that is the Alfonso, Badami and Sindura varieties. And the, the fruit that uh, ripen later on in the season even flower a little later than these varieties that I just mentioned. So we usually see the, the flowers starting at the end of Jan and they, depending on the varieties, they start all the way up to the end of Feb. And subsequently, they also end 45 days later. And that is when we start to see the first of the raw fruit show up, when the flower turns into the fruit. Um, this is a crucial part in the uh, process of, uh, I mean, of getting a good yield, because this is the point at which your fruit are most susceptible to fruit flies. We'll get into that a little bit late, later in terms of how to prevent them and how to keep them at bay. But this is just to keep in mind, because this is the point at which the seed of the fruit is very soft. Um, even though the outside is usually, the outer layer and the skin is quite tough, the seed itself is very thin and very soft. So this is the point at which your insects are going to lay their eggs. We'll get into that a little bit later. So the raw fruit remain on the tree for another 45 to 50 days, uh, at which point they begin, to start, they begin to ripen on the tree. And this is the point at which you need to gauge when you want to pluck it, so on and so forth. And you want to wait for the color to start changing for you to do that. That's how we do it at Danilo, to ensure that we get the best quality fruit. Because the longer that the fruit stays in the tree, the longer it, the, the more it imbibes all of the nutrients and the glucose and things like that, that the tree is providing to the fruit. So at the end of the day, we get a sweeter fruit, a more flavorful fruit. And um, if you do the right things with pest control, you can, you can be guaranteed a good yield. Um, just in terms of when you want to uh, wait to pluck your fruit, uh, this is the Mallika variety. Uh, this fruit is characterized by being completely green and when it ripens, it just it becomes yellow. There isn't a mixture of colors like we see in some varieties like Neelam and Sindura. Um, I'll show you that in a bit. But ideally what you want is, this is what the fruit will look like in the tree when it is raw. Of course, fruits vary in terms of what they look like depending on the variety. But we want to wait till you get a slight yellow coloring on the fruit. Uh, all of this, the black markings are completely natural. There's a mixture of some of the sap that falls from the tree and dust and all of that. Uh, this gets wiped just after the fruit is plucked. But you basically want to wait for a slight color change to give you an idea of when to pluck it. Um, this fruit is one that has fallen from the tree. So because of these black spots, you know that there's going to be a lot of there will be worms in this, so this isn't for sale. This is to give you an idea of what sort of a change you're looking for between a raw fruit and when it comes time to pluck it. Um, this fruit isn't ripe yet. Um, you can't tell through the video, but it is still quite firm. But the color has begun to change, begun to change and that's what you want to look for before plucking your fruit to get the best quality of fruit at the end of the day. So this is the generic plucking tool we use in the farm to 
pluck everything from our amlas to our mangoes to oranges and tamarind and everything. It's very simple and straightforward. It's a little metal bu bucket with small teeth at the end. The idea is that you scoop the fruit into this so that the stalk gets caught in one of these teeth and you basically yank it off. Um, I'm just going to pluck a few mangoes to show you the variety that we have and what a ready to pluck fruit might look like. Um, this is an example of what our sindura would look like in time for plucking. And this is a clearly overripe fruit that will be infested with worms. But I thought I'll just show you what a ripe sindura looks like. Um, it goes from this red and green color and you can see that it's starting to yellow. So it's beginning to ripen on the tree. And this is what we want to look for before we pluck the fruit, ideally. And this is what the fruit looks like when it's fully ripe. The green turns into yellow. The red is characteristic of the sindura. Hence it gets its name, sindu kumkum. And um, this is, of course, far too ripe for the tree. This is a waste fruit. But this is what, what you want to be looking for. Okay. This is a good example of a fruit that is ready to pluck and one that isn't so much. Um, this is the Alfonso variety. You will see that A, this fruit when plucked has a lot more sap coming out of it. It's still oozing sap. Right? But this one isn't oozing sap. Because this is a little more ripe and ready to pluck than this is. Sure, you can still pluck your fruit at this stage. This is where you ideally want to be plucking it because this is the beginning of the ripening phase. And again, this will take about four to five days to ripen. For us, from a commercial standpoint, it makes it easier to uh, store it before selling it than when it's this ripe. But at the end of the day, what I want to show you is the color difference. This has started to yellow out a little bit more than this fruit, right? They have, they both have these white specks, which are indicators of it is ready to be plucked. But this has started to ripen more because of, as you can see, of the yellowness on the fruit. The Alfonso, as many of you know, is a completely yellow fruit when it ripens. Um, much like many mangoes, it, the smell gets stronger, the color starts to get a little richer, and, uh, with Alfonso's, as you know, the inside of the flesh is like a dark yellow. It's a very familiar flavor. All your ice creams, all your milkshakes use it. This is the Malgova. As you can see, when the fruit is plucked, in this case, it's uh, it's cracked and damaged at the bottom. But that sort of a sap will come from the fruit, even from the top when it is plucked. And this sap is uh, quite acidic and quite toxic to the skin. Not just the skin of the fruit, but also to human skin. If this is left on, on my hand for a few hours without being washed off, um, it tends to leave almost burn-like looking marks on the skin. The skin tends to blister and stuff. So this needs to be managed and taken care of quite well. So in most cases, when you pluck the fruit, uh, in this case, the stem has broken, but in most cases, it breaks off at the head of the fruit. And you'll have this sort of a sap secretion coming from the top. So what we do is, as soon as we pluck it, we invert the fruit and keep it on the ground so that we let this sap bleed out onto the ground, not onto the fruit or onto any of the other mangoes that we're plucking. Um, the idea is to minimize uh, the amount of the sap that sits on the fruit and um, and to ensure this to an even further extent once we uh, pluck it and we take it down to the storeroom we actually sit and individually wipe down each of these uh, fruits to ensure that we remove any excess any not excess any sort of residual um, sap that's remaining on fruit and of course as I mentioned earlier you have a lot of dust settling um, a lot of uh, tree sap you can even have bird droppings on the fruit and if you are if you live in the city you'll probably have a lot of uh, carbon deposits from pollution that you'll find on the fruit. So you want to sit and wipe down all of that, almost like a polish for the fruit. And you actually find that once you're done with that stage of it, the fruit almost shines. 
because at this stage it's completely green this one has no markings no signs of uh, worms having affected it um but of course all of these are all natural but you want to wipe off this as much as possible right this is the malgova um this is one of the last few uh, fruit that show up in the season for us at least among the say eight or nine different varieties that we have um this we will actually start plucking later this week moving into next week um these fruit are characterized characterized by its large size they get to between 700 to 800 grams per fruit uh, at the time of ripening uh, this isn't the largest of the lot if you can see there's actually much larger fruit in the tree and um the fruit is extremely sweet it's got a light yellow pulp um and the curious thing about this fruit is unlike the sindura i just showed you which is red and green and then changes to a red and yellow coloring the malgova doesn't change color at all the malgova stays green it just Uh, the smell starts to get stronger as it ripens and it starts to get softer so that is something that you have to keep in mind when trying to figure out if this is ripening or when or when you know it's ready to eat so the sindura mango as i said is characterized characterized by this red coloring on the top of it hence it gets its name sindur sindura um the fruit is a medium to small size fruit you end up getting about 7 or 8 fruit to a kilo um it's got an orange pulp uh not too much fiber uh and it's got a very particular flavor it's not known to be very sweet i mean of course it's sweet because it's a mango but among mangoes it's not the sweetest but it does have its own unique flavor okay this is the totapuri mango this is what is commonly used in pickles and consumed raw with salt and chili powder um this is what the fruit looks like just before it's ready to ripen or eat this of course is has been infected with a few worms but this color change is uh exactly what we want to look for before plucking this is a raw fruit and the interesting thing about this is now when it's been plucked it right now it got plucked with the stem and what i want to show you is there is a way for you to avoid the sap being produced uh when plucking it but it's usually only possible when doing it by hand so at the top of every fruit you will see a node where the branch kind of the branch ends and the fruit technically starts the stalk of the fruit starts what you want to do is even when you're plucking it from the tree you want to hold it at this point and just snap and it comes off easily which means it this is at this point still easy to store there is no sap falling from the fruit it's not going to dirty anything but again from a commercial standpoint when you're doing this in large numbers even this is likely to break towards the later stages of transporting it and when that happens sap is still likely to uh, seep from this fruit onto other fruit as well This is a practice that can be that can be done in your house if you have a few trees if you're not going to be tucking more than say 10 kilos where you can hand pick each of your fruit and still contain the spread of this um this sap on the outside. Uh this means you will also have better looking fruit because you won't have skin that has been affected by the sap and again it just easier to store keeps your hands clean as well. So when it comes down to pest control we we would prefer to prevent rather than cure or fix. So um one of the biggest uh, problems with growing fruits in like an orchard setup is fruit flies and certain funguses that grow if the trees are not if are, if the trees are planted too close to each other as I said not enough ventilation so on and so forth. But the biggest problem is the fruit flies that's what the worms are when you cut into an organic mango and you find worms these are the worms or the babies of these fruit flies as i mentioned earlier um the fruit flies uh, attack the fruit in its raw state so when the fruit is still raw the seed is quite soft and porous and can be penetrated and this is the point at which the fruit fly goes and lays its egg inside the seed the idea is that through the life cycle of the fruit the the life cycle of fruit coincides with the life cycle of the fruit fly the eggs remain in the seed till the fruit has grown 
until it comes to ripening. As soon as the fruit ripens, the eggs hatch, the worms come out and they feed on the pulp as do we, I suppose. So what we try to do is prevent these fruit flies from even getting to the fruit in the first place. It's not foolproof, but it has been extremely effective in what we have tried to do. And it's just a matter of understanding when the flowering happens, when the, uh, when the flowers turn into fruit and getting your timing right so, so that you don't miss the period in which your fruit are most vulnerable or susceptible to these fruit flies. The, and we do this basically using these pheromone traps. They're called pheromone traps because uh, the basic principle is that it uses a pheromone uh, secreted by the insect itself to attract it away from the fruit, from the produce. If you see this, this is a two-part box. The top has this block, I will talk about it in a minute. And the bottom is filled with water. Granted, this needs to be replaced and it's long overdue. But the idea is you put in clear water into this and attach it to the bottom of this clear uh, tub. Now, once this is filled with water, this has no additives in it. We haven't put anything in it at all. We attach it back to this and you will see a wooden block in the center of this piece. Now, that wooden block is, you know, your standard compressed wood uh, block that you can find in your local carpenters. But this is imbibed with a particular pheromone that is ex excreted by the female of the species to attract the male for mating. And in, in nature, the sex drive is far more, far stronger than the hunger drive in most animals. So, attracted by this, the fruit fly flies into into the contraption through the center of the donut and then hits the clear plastic section of it and then falls into the water and dies. This ensures that we keep the fruit fly away from the crop in the first place, not letting it uh, lay its eggs in the fruit. And as I said, it's not foolproof, but we've found that it has reduced our wastage from nearly 45% a few years ago to under 90%, uh, under 10% in today's um, season. Something to keep in mind with mangoes is that much like every fruit, um, they won't fruit, they won't produce fruit every single year. Um, fruit at the end of the day essentially is the energy store for the for the tree, for the plant, and it's a way for it to propagate. So through the seed, etc. So the tree is counting on animals to eat the fruit, go uh, drop the seeds elsewhere and for other trees to grow. But on some years, the tree wants to, I mean, basically what the tree does, it does not produce fruit and it uh, redirects all of that energy into itself and into growth. So you'll find that some years your mango trees won't have fruit at all, but in that monsoon you'll see fresh shoots, you'll see fresh branches, fresh leaves and you'll see that Overall, the tree has kind of grown 8-10%. I would liken this to companies that give out dividends. Most companies year on year will give out will give out dividends to their shareholders. But sometimes, once in a while, they'll hold back on the dividends and reinvest that into the company for long-term growth, short-term growth, whatever it is. And that's essentially what the mango tree is also doing. This isn't exclusive to just mangoes. A lot of trees do it and a lot of, a lot of different species of trees do it at different frequencies. Something like an avocado might do it every alternate year. Your particular mango tree might do it once in three years. Some of us do it once only in seven years. It's completely dependent on the genetic makeup of that particular tree. And I suppose some of the conditions that it is growing in. Depends on how much nutrition it's getting. Is it getting enough water? Um, and things like that. example of a mealybug infestation that we find on our mangoes, our mango trees. Um, this can be tackled with organic uh, pesticides that you can find online um, and if you need have any questions about it you can reach out to us. We haven't used any uh, this year, or we haven't used any, uh, so you still find a lot of this uh, on quite a few of our trees. Um, you'll see that there are little sediments of the bug on the on the fruit itself. That is the I suppose the nest or the cocoon of the insect and you can see it's punctured holes into the fruit uh, at the bottom. But the, the infestation is also found on the 
sorry, on the tree itself. And you can see this white powder that as you remove, the insects are inside. These have of course died at this point, which is why everything is dry. But all of that is worms and their nests, essentially. Uh, you can avoid this by having by having good a well pruned tree that has a lot of ventilation on the inside, something that's watered regularly and taken care of. Uh, you can also uh, tackle this by literally just removing the branches or the twigs that have this, but that doesn't necessarily stop it because these will have to be cut off and then burnt to ensure that the spread is mitigated and minimized to just that point. Um, so this, there are organic uh, alternatives to battling this. We haven't used it, but it's very easily available and you can find people online who are, who are even uh, able to advise on what to use, how much to use, so on and so forth. Uh, here at Nerlu, we grow between 20 to 30 different varieties of fruits. Uh, all organic, all grown as naturally as possible without any sort of additives of any kind. Um, we grow chikus, guavas, bananas, varieties of bananas, papayas, jackfruit, um, bun um, water apple, rose apple, breadfruit, oranges, and quite a few more. Um, we sell all of our produce directly from the farm and from our place in Janaga. And if you'd like to place an order, you can get in touch with us through our page on Instagram, where you can find my number, so you can send me a message on WhatsApp or any other form of media that you use um, and we'd be happy to deliver to you wherever in the city. Um, we're also open to having people over for farm visits um, and in the near future we'll also be opening up the space as a campsite. Um, so we'd be happy to have people over because what we want to do is extend this agricultural experience to people who don't have access to it. And um, this isn't too far away from the city and the more we spread uh, information and knowledge about sustainable, natural farming. I think the better it is for everybody in the community as well. Tante petti nai koko jumbue, pali tupi nai gontu musue. Oh koko koko koko, bale koko talpule. Dai mo.